Hi, everyone. My name is May Milano, and I'm here to talk about our new work on a flexible type system for fearless concurrency. This is joint work with Josh Takati and Andrew Myers. Our setting is one in which a series of threads or processes perform computations by mutating shared objects. These objects are stored in some centralized shared memory, and threads communicate by exchanging references to these objects. In other words, our setting is traditional shared memory computing, a setting that's been around for decades and for just as long has been famous for its tendency towards destructive data races. A common class of solutions to this problem involve partitioning our shared memory into a set of reservations. The idea here is that every single thread gets its own reservation on the heap, its own private area where it can manipulate objects. As threads exchange objects by sending them as messages or acquiring and releasing locks, reservations shift accordingly, granting the receiver access to the associated memory and restricting it from the sender. This is the same principle that you're familiar with from things like mutual exclusion. It's the same thing we try to prove with separation logic, but remember it's just a principle. It's something that programmers have to remember to get right. Our goal is a type system that solves that for them. We're introducing a fearless type system that uses affine types to provably eliminate these destructive data races. Now, unlike some affine type systems that provably eliminate destructive data races you may be familiar with, Ours does so while allowing arbitrary object graphs, avoiding any dynamic nulling or edits to the object graph just for the purposes of reading, and without any extensive annotations. We need a single keyword on fields sometimes outside of function declarations. But before I can get into how we make this magic work, let's talk about affine types as they're incorporated into languages like Rust. So in an affine type system, we associate references with resources. As we type check, we track the usage of those resources through the program. Some operations, like releasing a lock or sending a message, consume the associated resource, making it a static error to use that resource after it's been consumed. The key invariant that we use here is one of uniqueness. In a language like Rust, there is at most one reference in the object graph linking any object into the object graph. Set object graph twice, that's okay. This uniqueness is a powerful reasoning principle, but it's also a bit of a limitation. It makes languages like Rust famously have trouble representing arbitrary graphs. In fact, if I were to go and Google how to implement a simple data structure, like a circular doubly linked list in Rust, uh, I would find that, like many before me, this is a real challenge. So let's look at this circular doubly linked list in particular to develop a reasoning about why it might be a challenge. And the core issue, of course, is aliasing. This is a class that might represent our doubly linked list. We've got a list node next and a list node previous linking the spine, and a payload that represents the object stored, or rather points to the object stored at that position in the list. Note that there's not a clear ownership structure here in the list nodes. There's next and previous, but neither of them are really the primary reference. Payload might wind up being owned. Also, one of our goals was not to rely on nullability, so nothing will be nullable in this language, despite its resemblance to Java. Let's look at some code that uses our circular doubly linked list. Our primary goal for our type system is to answer, is code like this safe? I'm gonna walk through this line by line. So to begin with, we have some uh, list, we get our list head and we store it in a variable O1. Then we grab the next pointer, dereference it, store it in a variable O2. We then send O1's payload to one thread and O2's payload to a separate one. Then the sender thread exits, making it a static error to, sorry, the sender thread exits, making it impossible for the sender to race with either receiver. So far seems okay. Two different green boxes, two different arrows, looks good. But consider a list of size one. In this case, O1 and O2 are gonna be the same object because our list was circular. So when we go and send O1's payload to a destination and O2's payload to a different destination, we wind up having sent a reference to the same object twice. Thread one and thread two can race. 
The error here was that our programmer has wrongly assumed that O1 and O2 are distinct objects. Our programmer has failed to reason correctly about aliasing. Now there's lots of ways to fix this code. One particularly silly one is to just add an assignment here. In this case, I've decided to set O1.payload to some new object in between the two send calls. This code now doesn't have any data races. Uh, thread one is gonna get O1's payload, thread two will either get O2's payload or whatever new object we just constructed. Our type system needs to be able to prove that this code isn't racy, whereas this code does have a tendency towards destructive data races. And the way we do that comes in two parts. We use affine regions and a novel focus mechanism. Let's start by dividing our tree up into a heap of regions. Dividing our heap up into a tree of regions, sorry. Regions are an organizing principle. They're an abstraction over object graphs. Within a region, objects can freely reference each other, forming pointers without worry about a tree structure or ownership structure um, at all. Whereas across regions, we have that Rust style uniqueness requirement. References with cross regions must be the only way to reach their target. They must transitively dominate their target. They must be the unique way into that region. In other words, we've replaced the notion of what our affine resource was. Rather than being references or objects, regions now become our affine resource. Regions are now the granularity with which we can reason about concurrency with which, with which we can send objects around. They also have to come from somewhere. And in our case, they come from a single keyword annotation, ISO. ISO standing for isolated indicates to the programmer that whatever they've annotated is fully contained in the abstraction. It's basically owned by that abstraction. You should use it anywhere that you've got an encapsulation relationship like this list node basically owns its payload. We assume, as I said before, that cross-region references can only be stored in ISO fields. We actually enforce that. Additionally, we require that by default, these cross-region references dominate the reachable target. This allows us to use these ISO annotations to draw our region graphs. Let's look back at our erroneous example with our intuition of regions in hand. So what I should expect here is that it's an error, so it's gonna to try to double spend a resource, or it's gonna to try to consume a region twice. And it's easy to spot the first consumption of a region when O1.payload is sent away. But it's harder to spot the second one. O2.payload might actually be a distinct region from O1.payload. Every payload has its own little box, so every payload is its own region. But again, that's only in some instances. In other instances, it's the same one. In other words, the number of regions varies dynamically based on the size of the list just like the number of payloads do. Our type system is going to reject this code whether we are in this case or the other. Now let's look at the corrected code. Our type system can reason that this code is correct. At a very high level, and I promise I'm gonna go through this again slower in like a minute. Um, at the beginning of this code fragment, we assume that error invariants hold, which is to say those payload references they dominate their targets. They are those unique references. That means that when we go to perform our initial send, we get to assume that we've targeted a new object, that it exists, that it's valid, and we send it away. And we also know that we've now broken that invariant. By sending this payload, we've made it so that that payload reference targets something not dominated. We also know that we've assigned the same exact path that we broke right afterwards and that in so doing, we've restored our invariant, whether we're in this case or not. What our type system needs to do, therefore, is track the exact path by which any of our invariants have been broken, so that we're able to detect when they've been restored by mutations to that path. The mechanism which does that is something that we call focus. So let's look back to our incorrect example using this focus in detail. To start with, our type system knows only that we have a region in which our list lives, and that's it. It's represented here by the letter R with this empty angle brackets. When we go to try to send 
the first thing we need to do is access the region that is targeted by payload. Notably, we don't have a capability on that. This is where our focus mechanism comes in. Focus allows us to track specific variables, injecting them directly into our static context. In so doing, we actually generate a capability for the regions which their isolated fields target. What we've done here is we've taken O1, we've literally written it into the static context at type checking time. We've literally written that it's got a payload field, which we know about from the type, that targets some new isolated region. Since this is a new isolated region, something that was otherwise unreachable, we're safe to just generate a random new name for it, which is how we know to call it R prime. Note also that there's nothing on the left here that shouts, you need to focus now. The focus is automatically inferred. All right, we can now proceed with the send. As I was hoping to motivate earlier, our send needs to consume a resource. And it does so by just deleting R prime, eliminating the capability on that region. It hasn't updated the map, so we still know O1 has a payload that points somewhere we don't have access to. Now in our erroneous example, we're going to want to do the same thing to O2, but we can't. And that's because of the other key invariant we need to keep in mind. We are only going to be able to focus one object per region, which means we can't add O2 into this region. That's because we can't reason about aliasing within the same region. We don't know if O1 and O2 are equal, so we can't focus them at the same time. Okay, let's look at our corrected example. Here we are um, rewinding back to the point where we did that send. Now in our corrected example, the next line here is an assignment to a new object. Constructing that new object will create a new region, which corresponds to the location that object's in. When we perform the assignment, all we have to do statically is update the map, repointing our payload from R prime to R prime prime. At this point, the static region that we've highlighted here looks a lot like the initial region we generated up to alpha equivalence. We've got some O1 in a region that points to some valid um, R prime prime and there's no other details we know. This will allow us to remove the focus that we automatically inserted because we restored the domination invariant. Once we've removed this focus here, we are free to refocus it onto O2, which will allow the rest of the example to type check, following the same logic as we had before. By combining this focus mechanism, with our affine regions, we've actually been able to prove through a formulation of progress and preservation that we are free from destructive races. No object may be used after it has been sent to another thread. And this allows us to declare to victory. Our mechanisms have provably eliminated destructive data races, all while allowing arbitrary object graphs within regions without any automatically inserted nulling or swapping or dynamic mechanisms and while needing significantly limited annotations, just one keyword that appeared on one field of a class. Now, obviously we do much more than this in the paper. In particular, we have some dynamic mechanisms that allow you to refine your knowledge of regions. We've got some functions that you can write down with expressive syntax for the declarations that are straightforward for simple cases and get arbitrarily more complex as you want arbitrarily more complexity. And all of this has proofs in the paper and mostly in the appendix. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Very nice talk, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, the example that you showed reminds me of using swap. So you did, you did something and you assigned it to a new thing, but I imagine you could swap it with anything. Did yeah. you think about just having a swap primitive or does your primitive that allows you to separate the swapping of the, of the memory uh, give you greater flexibility? That's actually a really good question, and when we were building this talk, we kept running into the problem where all the co really compelling examples that didn't just degrade to swap took about 12 lines. Um, there are, however, those examples. Uh, for example, if I wanted to remove the tail from this doubly linked list, um, I don't want to introduce nullability or swapping because the tail's actually going away, and there is nothing to swap at that point. 
Additionally, there's lots of cases where you have structure where you don't want an option type at every granularity. You rather would like one at a top level. Um, and having the requirement that you can construct all of that complexity in order to just swap out the bottom element so that you have a dummy thing for swap is kind of cumbersome. And a follow-up, do you have, um, have you started experimenting with an implementation to see uh, what programs you can implement? So we do have about uh, a few hundred, I think 2,000 lines of examples hanging out on the paper. Um, the most exciting one we have is a red-black tree where we can encode the actual requirements of doing the shuffle operation directly into like the region system, which is pretty cool. Uh, hi there, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to understand better why you are trying to avoid null uh, so much, because I think we have type systems now that could at least prevent the code from dereferencing null, or does that get very tricky in the presence of concurrency? I just wanted to understand that a little bit better. So in the presence of concurrency, in particular, my nullability requirements are not like null is evil and you should never use an option type. It's the type system shouldn't implicitly introduce it unless the program requests it does. So if we look at our um, erroneous example here, some related work um, just automatically sees a read of a isolated field here and replaces it with a swap with null. And if you were to run the a type checker that does that on this example, it would pass the example because you just wind up sending null the second time. And we really didn't like that. So regardless of whether you personally want to swap with null, totally can do that. We just wanted to make sure that examples that would have only worked because they'll involve a null reference would fail the type system. Okay, so you're trying to avoid the system like magically introducing nulls where you don't really see it in your code. Yeah, or similarly, forcing the programmer to add an option type somewhere that they don't believe it should exist to satisfy the type checker. Hi, it was a really nice talk. Um, I have a question. So I'm trying to, I'm puzzling a bit about this example. So is the idea that uh, when you said send 01.payload to thread one, it then has mutable access to it? Or sorry, it, I couldn't hear you over the door. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, is, does, does thread one then get mutable access to 01? Yes. yes, sorry, I should say that there's um, no immutability anywhere in the system. Every reference you ever see is mutable. Every reference is immutable? Or? Every reference is mutable. Is mutable, Every okay, time you all see references it. are mutable. Okay, all right, yeah. I, I had one follow-up question. Sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I was. I, so I, I don't know if you're familiar with the ghost cell work we had at I ICFP am familiar last with the ghost year. cell work. Okay. So uh, can you can you pass up to there? We were uh, tackling a very. I mean, a related problem. I'm still not exactly sure. I don't think it's the same exact problem, uh, but dealing with how to program things like doubly linked list in uh, in safe rust. Right. Um, and there, and we were sort of abusing the lifetime mechanism to encode something like regions. So I'm wondering if you can compare it all. Those cells are really cool as a backport to the Rust type system. They, if I remember the paper correctly, they basically involve grabbing a closure, opening it up, getting a special version of a reference within that closure that you can use to do aliasing, and then returning one thing out of that closure. Um, that now, I, I got it wrong, it's fine. Uh, the, the two things that we were hoping to improve over the ghost state work was one, the annotation freedom, it's, very, like writing linked lists and doubly linked lists here doesn't involve reasoning about regions directly, just putting that ISO keyword a couple of places and then writing straightforward code, which is nice. It's quite possible that you could translate the type system here into like a desugaring into ghost cells, but we haven't tried to do that. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.